Uh, I'm Ravindra. I work with uh, Vasil, an organization based in Hyderabad. We are a network based organization and we anchor the network hub of RRA network. First uh, conclusion we came uh, across, uh, came to, is actually not uh, taking, moving away from this framework of green devolution and look at rainfed areas afresh. So if you look at rainfed areas, what are the opportunities? What are the strengths of rainfed areas on which we can build upon uh, the growth processes, the sustainable growth processes, uh, increased productivity, production and diversification. So that is the framework that we started uh, uh, looking at. Initially, it all started with a critique of green devolution, uh, which is failing in rainfed areas. The second step, we, we no longer start critiquing because that is something, but we need to look at the rainfed areas per se and then see what are the strengths and how do you build upon that. So uh, it started from there, then we see how you revive the uh, ecosystem. The major constraints we find are, so it is an undulating topographies, it's not uh, uh, it's not a uniform black soils, deep black soils. It is very uh, uh, very varied soil uh, typologies, and then the soil depth is uh, uh, not high, and you have um, substantial lands in the higher slopes with shallow depths of soil, and then the rainfall distribution is completely uh, erratic, and then varied across uh, the country. So diversity of the uh, physiographic factors of the of the climate factors of the cultural aspects of farming uh, by the communities you know this kind of a diversity is there then how do you build a system that that builds on the diversity of the system if you actually look at it uh, though though we say food security is is the is the outcome of green devolution but even today 81% of uh, uh, pulses, large percentage of millets and the oil seeds are all produced in rainfed areas. We never actually looked them as part of food. We only took um, paddy and uh, wheat as food. So, so substantial nutrition base of the countries in rainfed areas. That is the strength of the rainfed areas. That also comes from the diversity of crops. So, so how do we actually build a, a development process, a growth process, building on diversity? is something that we need to look at. So in that we, through consultations, we arrived at some propositions where the first thing we uh, we came to a conclusion is there is no magic bullets. There is no one particular technology or one particular seed you know, that can actually transform. Because of the diversity, because of the variations, you need to have location specific, decentralized uh, approaches to technology, planning and investments and governments. So, uh, so the centralized uh, in, uh, research institution-led technologies or uh, development packages do not work in rainfed areas. So, we we actually uh, are arguing uh, during the 12th plan period. Also, a uh, uh, lot of discussion taking place on how do you decentralize uh, uh, without having a central program. How do you decentralize? How do you develop a location-specific plans that that includes communities' knowledge and their aspirations into into designing uh, crop systems, into into developing technologies that are location specific. So, along with that, we need to actually move away from the centralized systems. So, all the agriculture support systems, be it seed systems, be it uh, uh, nutrition systems, um, soil nutrition systems, be it pricing systems, everything is centralized. No, that doesn't work. You can centralize uh, for two, three crops, but 25 crops you cannot dictate at the central level where uh, situation varies substantially. We are looking at uh, know, how you build soils because soil is an important part of uh, rainfed ecosystem. Uh, unless you have good soils, there is no base for productivity production. So how do you improve the soils is, uh, you know, without, uh, we, we arrived at an approach called 3M approach. Uh, how you build soil organic matter, how you, how you uh, harvest lot of rainfall in the soils and retain it for longer periods with, with more and more organic matter uh, coming into the soils. And then uh, how you increase the microbial diversity, microbial population in the soils, the 3M moisture, 
matter, organic matter and microbes. Now how you actually promote, synthesize this thing. And this will not happen by external application, compost application or you know, some nutrition supplements will not bring in organic uh, matter increase in the soils. So it has to necessarily come from crop systems. So single crop systems are poor organic matter uh, generators. So we you need to have diversified crop systems in the, in the traditional agriculture. Uh, the con uh, convention is one third of the crop should go into the soil. So can we build a crop system where one third of the so uh, crop production is actually uh, going back into the soil, enriching the soil. And then you know, that second principle is that the crop system should cover the soil for longest duration possible. We have a 12 month period, so at least up to March, you know, uh, February, March. If the soil is covered, then uh, uh, then the soil temperature uh, at the surface will be low and it is not exposed to sun and then the organic carbon uh, matter doesn't desiccate and it builds, it enriches the soil. So, so how do you actually devise such a crop system that is there for longer period that converts a lot of uh, production into soil uh, carbon? This is uh, uh, one primary uh, uh, condition you know, that comes in. Another one third of the crop should go into the livestock system. So livestock system complements both crop and uh, soil. So how do you how do you strengthen the extensive livestock systems? Livestock systems that are based on grazing. Uh, uh, no, because grazing actually converts the uh, biomass into in, through the guts into the organic matter. No, it recycles the nutrients across the landscape. So, how do you support the extensive livestock systems? Bring synergies between crop systems and extensive livestock systems. Third is how you actually with this diversity, how you actually change the uh, the the food, uh, how you bring in the food diversity in the consumption. You know, if you if you are eating only rice, you need only rice. Uh, if you are eating diversified products, then diversified products can come from the farms. They can be local markets that are generated. Your market system will evolve. So we we a combination of these things we should have as a paradigm in diet areas. A second major aspect is how you actually regenerate the ecosystem services. Unless you you regenerate uh, water resources. Uh, through capturing the soil moisture and through regenerating the base flows in the springs and in the streams and uh, you know, effective governance of the groundwater, use groundwater is precious, use it um, uh, for exclusively protective irrigation, not to waste for intensive irrigation. So how do you bring in this kind of a changes in the management of water systems is something that uh, that is the uh, probably third part of the whole thing, crop systems, soils, uh, water management. With this water management kind of a thing, it also opens up opportunities for fisheries. In several of the areas where uh, rainfall is more than uh, 700 mm, there are a lot of uh, seasonal water bodies and huge potential of uh, fish production for local consumption in the seasonal water bodies. But our fisheries policy doesn't recognize this. The uh, National Fish, uh, Fisheries Development Board or any fisheries program doesn't look at water bodies that are less than one hectare uh, submergence area and they look for perennial water bodies. So so how do you bring a, a different production system in the seasonal smaller water bodies that are used for local consumption of fish uh, is another uh, dimension to it. Similarly markets, you now markets are specialized. So if you, if you want to go into the market, uh, you have to go for a, a single product which is similar in size, shape and color and the consistency. This is not possible in rain-fed areas because rain-fed areas, the weather is not in your control. It is not a, 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 it is not a system where it is, you have control on the inputs. Uh, so uh, so we, we need to create market systems for varied crops. Uh, so, so how do you build the diversity into this thing is another issue. Uh, this is market. Likewise, we have some 10 propositions, which you can see later, uh, uh, to actually, if you work together on these 10 propositions or principles uh, in a particular uh, geography and of all location specific approaches, then we see growth very much possible in it. Say, for example, you now people say dialand systems are less productive. They are 
we find consistently that they're less productive in the conventional paradigm of green revolution compared to this. But if you take the area productivity, if you landscape, uh, if you take a landscape and see the totality of the productivity, that can that is substantially higher, and it can be increased also for that. For example, we have uh, in our millets program. Uh, one areas where we are promoting millets, uh, uh, we find introduction of uh, uh, agronomic practices in tribal areas, increased productivity of millets. So the practices are we combine the system of rights intensification and a traditional method called bully and ZBNF practices, natural farming practices together into a into a composite uh, agronomy, and that has resulted into some twofold increase in productivity. So these people used to get about three to four quintals per acre. Now they are getting on an average eight to ten quintals per acre. And we have an outlier, which is up, uh, which is out to 1.5 to 1.6 tons, is 15 to 16 quintals per acre productivity. So higher productivity is possible uh, in dryland areas, provided we actually relook at the uh, framework of uh, the the approach, the science. And then this, we find the natural farming practices much more amenable and then productive uh, in the rain-fed situation. We need to have a different approach to rain-fed agriculture. Our agriculture institutional systems are are developed for green revolution agriculture, which is centralized, which is subsidy based, which is input based. But rain-fed agriculture. It has a different uh, paradigm. It's a different paradigm. It is diverse. It is not uh, uh, input based. So from inputs to knowledge base, uh, uh, you need to move in. So we have to engage farmers with, uh, in terms of improving the knowledge of the ecosystem and bringing science into that understanding. Uh, uh, bringing science and technology into actually how you increase labor productivity, reduce the uh, the, the risks. No, and then create uh, opportunities in the market. You need to you need to develop different market mechanisms. So the engagement in rainfed areas, which should be different, if government can invest properly on the rainfed areas in terms of uh, engaging with knowledge, engaging with location specific uh, uh, development of technology, and supporting the institutional systems that provide inputs to the to the ecosystem regeneration and investments on the natural resources. These are the things that uh, that are much needed, along with uh, systems of governance of resources. You know, if if such a system is there, then the productivity of rainfed lands, which are you know, more than 50% in India, can be e easily doubled. Now there are uh, uh, no uh, low productivity considered as low productive systems, but uh, but with very high potential. You need to de-risk uh, uh, the rainfed agriculture. You need to rethink about the water resource management in rainfed agriculture. Irrigation should be sort of how do you protect large numbers of farmers from the vagaries of rainfall, from the rainfall failures. So if you can actually extend two irrigations to substantial areas that are rainfall dependent, then the crops are secure. When the crops are secure, production is secure. When the production is secure, livelihoods of farmers are secure. So how you build this uh, uh, is, is very, very important. And we need to move away from this irrigation centric water resources understanding to an ecosystem centric water resources development. So that can actually bring in paradigm shape and increase growth and prosperity in the areas substantially. Not only doubling incomes, it can be more.